So this is the place where I work. And in next eight minutes, I'll try to cover these eight controversies in the management of the cardioquina injury. So one by one, I'll just try to address in each in one minute. So I'll just do this. So I think people who are a neurosurgeon, they will probably recognize this man. This is a letter he wrote in 1924 to his parents in which I, 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 he said, I realized that greatness was not frills and superficialities, but it lies in the true blue of unselfish devotion. I think all the people who are helping in the education, probably part of this group, but what did he mean by far more than false? I think people will recognize him. This man, this gentleman is Edward Walter Dendy, who has contributed immensely in the neurosurgery field. And he is one of the founding forefathers of neurosurgeries. He published more than 159 articles. And one of the articles in 1929, Archive of Surgery was titled, Loose Cartilage from Intervertebral Disc Simulating Tumors of the Spinal Cord. And this was the picture of the original article describing his intraoperative finding. As you can see, this large extruded disc fragment causing cardioquina compression. The interesting thing to read from this paper is that tumor had been removed. I'll just read the highlighted parts. Two weeks before the admission, he had severe attack of pain in the lumbar region. Six weeks before the admission to the hospital, he had a dead feeling in the legs. Two weeks before, he was later able to uh, stand alone. And one week before, uh, he had a retention of urine. So essentially, he lost bladder and bowel control more than a week before the admission and the surgical procedure. And so this is an important point uh, as the uh, progress in my talk. And he did the cisternogram and found a com almost complete block at L3 level. And he thought probably it was a tumor. And he did the operation, removed the disc. And this is uh, what he said at the end of the paper, the vesicle control was regained in two weeks and rectal control four weeks after the operation. So this, someone who had complete loss of bladder bowel function, he regained his bladder and bowel function. And six months after the operation, he was almost independent and walking. So what's the deal here? If so we still have to operate this patient within 24 hours or we, have, we still operate if they present late. So I'll go again one by one. So what is the cardioquina syndrome essentially? There is still controversy about the, the definition of the cardioquina syndrome. If you read different textbooks and different papers, the five or six uh, symptoms which stand out are the findings of the sphincter disturbance, settle anesthesia, or the sensory dis disturbance around the perineal area, significant motor weakness, low back pain, and or sciatica, unilaterally or bilaterally, and bilateral absence of atlas reflexes and sexual dysfunction. Essentially, the patient can present uh, with the previous history of the back and leg pain and can have an episode which then results into the cardioquina, or somebody can present with no previous history and acute cardioquina, and then there's Third group is, which is impending cardiochina, where a patient can present with back pain, bilateral leg pain, but did not have any bladder bowel disturbance or sphincter disturbance at the time of presentation, but they can then later on develop these symptoms. So that's the group to watch. So five characteristic features, bilateral sciatica, reduced perianal sensation, altered bladder function, loss of anal tone, sexual dysfunction. But if you review the literature, 
not all will be present in every patient and there's low sensitivity and specificity of all these findings. So like this paper said, test with the lowest predicted level for the cardiac syndrome was anal tone. Almost of a non, half of non-compressive group had reduced anal tone. Then this is the paper. This study again shows the same thing about the sphincter disturbance. The diagnostic value of the anal tone is uh, not that high. Then this is the paper about the perianal sensation again. In isolation, the diagnostic value of the finding is not that high. Two more papers again about saddle sensation and light touch and pinprick. Again, the sensitivity of the following test is relatively poor. Perianal sensation, altered urinary or perianal sensation in isolation, uh, the uh, uh, value as a diagnostic fact is not that high. Now, the residue of bladder volume, this is the patient with the suspected cardiac minor syndrome. Once he passes the water, and then if you measure the residual volume, that probably has got the most uh, significant sensitivity and specificity, about 90%. If they have a residual volume more than two to 400 mil pulse wide, that probably has got 87% sensitivity and 76% specificity to diagnose the cardiac minor syndrome. Now, if we go into the definitions, the Fraser et al said, if there's 100% agreement, then we call it a unanimity. 75 to 99% is a consensus and 51 to 74% is the majority and zero to 50% is no consensus. So after reviewing 105 papers in the literature, there is no unanimity or consensus in the literature about the sensitivity and specificity of all these five uh, is, uh, symptoms to diagnose the cardiac minor syndrome. But majority view that bladder and sensory disturbance, that is 74% to 65% agree that probably are the main symptoms to watch for the cardiac minor syndrome. So sphincter disturbance, if the main cardinal symptom cardiac minor uh, syndrome is what is the nerve supply of the bladder and how do we control the micturation? So I'll just uh, discuss very briefly about this for the understanding for diagnosing the uh, sphincter disturbance, which is related to cardiac minor syndrome, which is neurogenic versus non-neurogenic. So the cortical center for the micturation is located in the superior frontal gyrus on the medial surface of the hemisphere and is responsible for the voluntary control of the initiation of the cessation. From there, the message goes to the pontine center. There are two pontine centers. The center one is a parasympathetic excitatory nucleus. And then the second pontine center is also an excitatory impulse to the lower motor nucleon of the onus. Uh, which is located in the S24 lateral part of the gray matter and controls the external urinary sphincter. So this is the organization of the higher control of the bladder. The cerebral cortex, the signal goes to the pontine center one, which is the parasympathetic excitatory nucleus. And from there, the signal can go either to pontine center two, and from pontine center two, the signal goes to the ONF nucleus from where the pudendal nerve arrives and it goes to external urinary sphincter to control the micturation. But when the, uh, we wide the urine, then the signal from the pontine center one to pontine center two is an inhibitory signal inhibiting the pudendal nerve and opening the external sphincter so that we can pass the urine. Hey, Amjad, we're at 10 minutes. Do you think you could wrap up in two minutes? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, so I'll skip this. The, essentially, the cardiac uh, in syndrome, the nerves which are involved are the uh, preganglionic parasympathetic and the potential nerves which are taken by the cardiac nerves. So I'll skip the control. So 73 years later, after the paper from the Dendy Walker, the review, the next uh, 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 credible review came from the Cambridge. 
And the conclusion of this article was that the pathophysiology of Gardner syndrome and, and still the timing of the surgery remains controversial and where urinary retention with overflow incontinence exists uh, at the presentation, we believe that urgent decompression confers no benefit. 76, three years later of that paper, that is 76 years from the original paper of the Dendy, Nick Todd wrote this paper in which he emphasized the timing of surgery following the cardiac syndrome probably does influence the outcome. But he did not say anything about operating after the 48 hours, whether that will help, but he said probably it will help. And then there was commentary on his paper in which it, it was, the argument was that operating next morning or operating after 48 hours still will be helpful. So I'll skip that for the sake of the time, but none of the literature says where your 24 hours starts and what are the, what is the difference between the objective signs and the subjective signs of the cardiac hyena. So essentially, the, this was a landmark paper by the, uh, Nick Todd in which he addresses the types of the cardiac hyena. So there are four types of cardiac hyena. One, the type one is impendic cardiac hyena where you don't have bladder bowel symptoms, but as the disease progress, you can have the symptoms. Then is incomplete cardiac hyena. And then there's cardiac hyena with retention and then there's complete cardiac hyena. Essentially message from these is that the early surgery within 12 to 20, uh, 24 hours is recommended in patient with impending, with incomplete, and uh, with the retention. And patient with, who have a complete cardiac hyena still benefit from the surgery, even if they're operated over 48 hours. Hey, Amjad, so, can we go to the conclusion slide? We're, we're now running pretty far over, please. So I think I'll just go to the concluding part of this. So that's the slide. The, in the suspected cardiac anaverse, where there's only back pain and bilateral leg pain, you have to watch these patients because they can later on develop the, the symptoms of cardiac anaverse syndrome. And they are the one, the group which benefits best from the surgery. Then there's incomplete cardiac hyena again with the urinary difficulties and some urinary sensation loss. Again, this group uh, uh, does very well with the early surgery and same is with the retention. And the fourth group, which is a complete cardiac hyena, the surgery, although you can operate them after 48 hours, but they still can benefit from the surgery. Thank you.